member for Oshawa. Thank you, Speaker. I'm always glad to stand in this legislature and speak on issues that matter to my community of Oshawa. Today, I am looking forward to sharing some perspectives from my riding, also from my region, but uh, a few from across the province in response to this growth budget um, brought forward by this government. Speaker, everyone knew that there would be cuts in this budget. You know, the, the government has made no secret uh, of their intent to reduce spending and, and cut where they deemed necessary or where they could. But, Speaker, I don't think anyone was prepared for the mean-spirited nature of the cuts. Um, and that's feedback that I'm getting from the community. I don't think folks were prepared for the reduction in investments or preventative in preventative spending. And what I mean by preventative spending it are things like, you know, when you say that um, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. You know, we all know that old adage, but it's it's true when we look at something like a budget that if you invest in medical interventions or you support families with dependents with disabilities, you invest in mental health, that then you don't see. Uh, as much in the way of acute care costs at the other side, um, that you could save folks and families heartache and anguish, um, which could also save the province, like I said, those acute costs associated with emergency room care or chronic care costs. So the cuts will hurt, but they aren't temporary. They will cost more in the long run and certainly will cost more to families. I would say that this is not a government that cares about those things. I think they are weirdly unmoved by the calls that they inevitably get. Uh, calls for help from across the province, from their constituencies. They become indignant when criticized, but you know, Lord knows they're going to stick to their top-line chants and messaging. Um, but here's what we're going to do today. We're going to delve into what the bill really says. And the title speaker, despite what you may have heard, is not actually the budget of booze and rebranding. It is protecting what matters most. And it might be about what, protecting what matters most to the Premier's people. But it isn't uh, about protecting public services or real people. It is about protecting government relationships with their people and their connections, which is, I would say, an increasingly uh, growing, protected, well-feathered nest of the Premier's friends. Um, it is good for the people that they're lining up to appoint to these special jobs while they're unceremoniously turfing independent officers of the legislature who um, aren't beholden to the Premier, but I digress. So, Speaker. Uh, let's look at the 2019 budget, and I'll start with education because that's where I started. I come to this legislature uh, by way of the classroom, and it was the Liberals who undervalued our world-class education system. I saw it firsthand as a teacher, and when they attacked educators and undermined the education that students received, I, I decided to stop taking it and run for election. And Speaker, I'll tell you something. Sometimes when you put up your hand, they choose you, <laughs> and um, so here I am. But I was inspired by the awful Bill 115 attack, um, and now we have this premier determined to make it worse by cutting teachers and education workers and dragging education back behind the rate of inflation. The budget allocates a 1.2 percent increase for education. Inflation is 1.9. So again, with the math, and maybe they could put this on their math test, but that's tantamount to a cut because 1.2 per cent is less than 1.9 per cent. School boards are warning that this level of funding will mean class sizes, uh, potentially up to 46 students, fewer courses, and thousands of unemployed teachers. This budget also sets it up for this government to review and reevaluate the existence of school boards. And, and Speaker, I would say that's not good news for students. Public education should be the great equalizer. It should be a path to opportunity regardless of background. But this Conservative government seems to want to create a crisis, wants to undermine the system, inflate class sizes, and ensure that the average kid gets stuck behind kids with, um, who can afford opportunities when it comes to eventual job competition down the road. Supporters of strong public education uh, recognize that there is a very real threat being posed to the futures of our children by this calculating government. And as, as we all saw, at the massive rally of education folks and, as we saw at the massive walkouts of determined students and, as we will see from parents, neighbours and everyday Ontarians, our children and their futures are worth fighting for. So a few things that we do not find in this budget, there's no plan to deal with violence in schools and classrooms. There's no mention of special education funding at all, despite all of the conversations we're having around autism. No plan to make the Ontario school system more equitable. No new funding for English as a second language. No changes to the problematic funding formula. 
and it is problematic, and no plan to deal with rural or remote school closures. Speaker, sticking with education, um, but getting to training colleges and universities, the Premier's new scheme takes more than $400 million away from post-secondary education, but also keeps them under the Premier's thumb, with a threat of up to 60 per cent of their remaining funding being withheld if they don't do as he wants. So funding tied to, quote, performance agreements for institutions to reach targets set by the government. Well, how are colleges and universities supposed to be sustainable with that kind of capricious, bossy thumb hanging over their heads? What is the goal in that? Making it more challenging for there to be a dynamic and strong post-secondary landscape? So I thought of a new license plate slogan, Mr. Speaker, for the Premier. Um, Welcome to PC Ontario, my way or the highway. <laughs> One to try. Um, moving into, and the member from Kitchener Conestoga, I know, is so excited to have comments after my speech, so he's welcome to. Um, but when it comes to health and wellness, Speaker, um, I have a letter here from 16 year old Tamara. She said, quote, I have been struggling with mental illness for about five years now, and a few months ago, I finally got the courage to reach out for help. I was ready to turn my life around until I got the news from my mother that it would be over 13 months before I'd be able to see any psychiatrist or therapist covered by OHIP. I then realized that I would be months away from graduating high school before I would ever be able to start my mental illness recovery journey. The fact that the wait list was so long discouraged me from continuing my recovery and left me hopeless I would ever get help since it was so far in the future. I would like to ask if you would consider increasing funding on mental illness treatment and consider people like me and many others that struggle with mental health every day. If you were to increase funding to make the wait list shorter, more people would be encouraged to reach out for help since they would be able to see a psychiatrist or therapist faster, and it would save more people from suffering from terrible mental illness. Speaker, I'm not sure what to say to, uh, to Tamara. Aside from the 2019-2020 packet of money in this budget, there is no information on how this government intends to spend $3.8 billion in mental health and addictions funding over 10 years. So how do we plan for that? When it comes to health care, despite the desperate need for investment into patient care, this government is funding health care below the rate of inflation. So again, tantamount to a cut. What will that mean for the already painfully long wait uh, in crowded ERs or for hallway health care. And, Speaker, we, we're hearing a lot from this government about um, protecting publicly funded health care. But I want to tell the folks at home that that is not, that's not the, the thing to hear. We need to be hearing publicly delivered health care. Because if we're going to take all of our public dollars and put them in a bucket, all of our public money in a bucket, and then we have different private um, health care providers that are able to reach into that bucket, but don't worry, you can use your OHIP card, and that's the reassurance. Well, that money is going to go not as far, because as soon as you are factoring in profit margins yeah. along with patient outcomes, well, then the money has to go in two places instead of to patient care. So it isn't, it's not just about publicly funded. We all know it's coming from the taxpayer, but it needs to be publicly delivered, because just you know, saying over and over, don't worry, you get to use your OHIP card, is not, is not what to focus on. It is how far is that public money going, and are we getting the best outcomes from it? How do we have better patient outcomes and ultimately lower acute care costs, or have fewer people in the ERs? Talk to your frontline, um, your frontline health providers. Work with them. Uh, listen to them. The Ontario Health Coalition had town halls across the province. You got so many good ideas from the folks there. Stop being afraid of the public. You don't just have to make decisions for them. You can make decisions with them. Um, I have a letter from Steve, and Steve says, quote, I'm a retired paramedic. I've been retired for 10 years and was a paramedic for 33 years. He had a few um, interactions with our local hospital that took a long time, a four-hour visit, a six-hour visit. But then he goes on to say, while waiting during the six hours, I also observed a number of ambulance stretchers with patients and paramedics in an unable to offload situation attending to their patients. This then creates a reduction in the number of ambulances available to service emergency calls due to being unable to offload, thus having to treat their patients in the hallways. These problems were systemic 10 years ago when I retired and remain the same today. Nothing appears changed, except maybe it is worse. I have no complaint regarding the staff or treatment, except for the fact it took and takes too long to streamline patients from arrival to discharge. 
When I retired 10 years ago, politicians and hospital administrators said things would change. Well, here we are 10 years later, and everything is the same. Nothing has changed. End quote. Sorry, Steve, that that, I, I, looking at the budget, things may continue, or as he suggests, might get worse. Um, and people are worried, Speaker. Um, you know, we've, we've talked about um, some of the potential changes coming, um, and I have a letter from someone about the chronic pain treatments and their concerns. So I want to get it on the record because I want the government to factor this in. They say, these injections help people with MS, lupus, Parkinson's disease, diabetic, neuropathic, pain, arthritis, musculoskeletal pain, car accident injuries, and countless other maladies. I suffered a serious injury in 1994 that has plagued me ever since. I need 23 shots per week so that I can stand upright, move my head, and walk instead of limping or shuffling. Nobody volunteers to be poked with needles 23 times a week because it's fun. We do it because we need these treatments to be productive members of society, not place a further burden on our health care system and to have some even small quality of life. The province is in an opioid crisis, and yet the Premier wants to severely limit a safe and non-addictive treatment, thereby leaving us no choice but to turn to opioids, legal or illegal, and go on disability because we're unable to function. It should also come to no as no surprise to the Premier that the people of Ontario value health care over foolishness like changing license plates and printing cute little stickers. Mm -hmm. We are not to blame for liberal mismanagement, yet the man of the people has thus far targeted the most vulnerable in society, children and the sick. One can't help but wonder which people he's talking about. We can't march at Queen's Park because most of us physically can't do it. We desperately need you to please champion our cause." End quote. And that's from Margaret. Speaker, um, when, it, when we're still talking about health care, and we should be talking about health care all day, every day, frankly, because it's on everyone's mind because they're so concerned. But at AMO uh, this past summer, this is part of the submission from the Federation of Northern Ontario Municipalities on the public health units, and they said, proposed changes to public health units has been a concern to FONOM. We ask that the government ensure that the numbers of public health units are not reduced. Well. Unfortunately, um, this PC government intends to reduce 35 public health units from 35 to 10 by 2020 and 2021. The government also intends to cut the number of public health laboratories, but no numbers provided. Speaker, when we talk about long-term care, the Central East uh, Lynn, which is my area and extended, uh, has the highest wait list and the second highest demand for long-term care in the province. The average wait time for admission in our Lynn is 252 days. The Ontario average is 149 days, and in the budget, there are no beds for the in the Central East Lane in our area, no new beds in our area. I don't know how that got decided. Dental care. Here on the opposition benches, we knocked on doors and talked about dental care, and we know that it was a winner. We know that everyone, regardless of partisan uh, inclination, had teeth in their mouths and wanted health, like wanted good dental health. Um, and, I, and honestly, like doing the right thing with this government is like pulling teeth, but unfortunately, the people of Ontario don't have that luxury. They can't get their teeth pulled unless, wait for it, they get an abscess. So they have to wait, hoping for an infection in order to have the pain like, relieved, in order to have the tooth removed. Well, and I am sorry if the minister is unhappy. Uh, I have six and a half minutes left, and I promise they will be action-packed. So, Speaker. When it comes to dental care, pain meds, pain meds or the hope of infection are what motivate people, because like, there's nothing else for them if they don't have benefits, if they don't have the money uh, to pay for dental. So the constant ER visits, did you do the math on that and the acute care needs? Because if you're not sure what it costs, ask doctors. I'm sure that they will tell you. People who have to go to the ER to get pain meds, side conversation, let's talk about opioids, but back to dental care. Why aren't we doing dental care for everyone or all seniors? So this government is excited about their, you know, for super low income seniors that they're providing dental care. I begrudge those seniors nothing. I know them personally, we all do. They spend a lot of time in our, in our, office, um, in our offices and they sincerely deserve all of the support that we can give them. But what about the other seniors? I don't understand. I, it, it just boggles the mind that this government would be so mean and literally divide seniors. I think it's terrible. Um, also terrible is moving right along to social services and, and um, 
the $1 billion cut from the Ministry of Children, Community and Social Services over four years. This is Ontario's most vulnerable and the social safety net that we all count on. Families with children with autism and people with disabilities were waiting for help. Spoiler alert, they're not going to get it. Special services at home, frozen. We had families here today who sobbed in the public galleries while the minister yelled her tone-deaf answer at us. Passport, no mention, so who knows? Our vulnerable neighbours deserve to know what they're facing. And when it comes to autism, I will say, and I'm happy to shout it in this room, I was so grateful to see a commitment to Grandview Children's Centre in this budget. There's been a lot of community advocacy, advocacy um, that resulted in that commitment. The magic of Grandview, though, is in the caring and the service it provides, and I don't know how going from a not-for-profit to a for-profit model will allow them to provide better services. And I do hope this government will look to places like Grandview that have great records of service and recognize that limiting families to a maximum of $5,000 will mean that no service providers will be able to deliver programming that evidence would support, that evidence shows would support unique children with unique needs. $5,000 won't go far enough for children. Um, Grandview and other service providers will have to become businesses and figure out how to offer a menu of piecemeal products and compete for the few dollars that will go towards therapy. But there's no mention of autism funding in this budget. So, billion dollars down in this ministry, no mention of autism. Um, I do have some letters from folks that I will not have a chance, sadly, to read on the record today, but I will find the time another day. Um, when it comes to child care, the region of Durham had said, uh, in its submission on the budget, we strongly urge your government to update the provincial allocation formula for early learning and child care to take into account both child population growth and the prevalence of low-income families. Subsidies need to be maintained as tax credits do not help the poor. Seems to be a bit of a theme with this government, does not help the poor. Child care, instead of an actual child care plan, they have sort of a, a don't really care credit because the subsidies versus the tax credit, you have to pay up front to get any back. And the people who come to our office, the people who cannot get back into the workforce because they can't find affordable childcare, are not going to thank you for a tax credit that they will never qualify for because they can't pay, they can't afford it in order to get it. You still have to pay up front in order to get the tax credit, and they are left out of that game. Families will never have a shot at becoming the upper income families that can afford child care because a parent can't go back to work because they can't afford child care. So this pretended care tax credit uh, is disappointing. They talk about wanting to grow the economy or support economic growth and jobs. This is a basic, basic concept. People can afford to go back to work because they can afford appropriate care for their children. Then, ta-da, you have more folks in the workplace. And statistically, Speaker, it's a female parent or caregiver that stays home and stays out of the workplace when affordable childcare stands as a barrier, which reminds me, what happened to the status of women? Like, I guess, did the Premier decree that women get enough or maybe that things are fine? Because there's no mention in the budget. Um, the word woman appears four times, twice in reference to police men and women in uniform, twice in reference to vulnerable groups, four times. The word alcohol is in 35 times. Wine, by the way, is only seven. Beer is 12, but alcohol is 35. Gambling is eight. Rape, speaker, doesn't get a mention. Shelter is mentioned twice, once about bail beds, once about shelter needs in a person's life cycle. Nothing about women's shelters. I have a letter from Bethany that I won't be able to read, but Bethany found herself in crisis with no nowhere to go. And she said, I've currently called all women's shelters in crisis bed here in Oshawa, and for the last three days, everything's been full. I'm 28 years old. As of April 1, 2019, I will be on the streets or, find, or trying to find safety and shelter. Our office is in connection with Bethany, but th Bethany is desperate. Speaker, I still have so many pages of notes. I want to give them heck on all fronts. So, oh, if I could have 20 more. Um, I will say I didn't hear anything about license plates at the door. Um, I did hear a lot about <laughs> dental and affordable housing. Um, I heard about transit needs, supports for children in their schools. I didn't hear anything about license plates or drinking from 9 a.m. Must have been in a, the wrong neighborhood. Um, I was up in Perry Sound, Muskoka for the NDP Riding Associ Association annual meeting, and they wanted me to ask this government face to face about the Northlander, which is a word that didn't make it into the budget, by the way, despite the fact that the budget was put together by the Minister of Finance, the member for Nipissing, um, and it's the Northlander I thought was a promise made in Huntsville, but he can't 
find enough letters to put together the word Northlander in his own budget. So I don't know how that's going to go over um, in northern communities. But you know what? Here's a slogan for your true blue license plates. PC Ontario, under review. The Northlander and everything else seems to be under review. Um, but, you know, give them their train and give people what it is that they've been asking for. Speaker, I'm looking forward to my final two minutes to wrap up a few of the final points and to further debate um, on this horrible budget. Thank you. Um, I would like to say that Oshawa did indeed get a mention in this budget, um, the Ontario budget protecting what matters most. So just to turn to that page 196, standing up for Ontario taxpayers. Quote, the federal government has indicated that it will help families affected by General Motors' GM decision to close the Oshawa assembly plant. Ontario welcomes the opportunity to work with the federal government to find solutions that meet the needs of affected families and all the people of Ontario without adding red tape and administrative burdens. I look forward to seeing what that would be. I was hoping for an auto strategy in this budget, but uh, no, not this one. Maybe the next budget. Speaker, the Minister of Finance stood in Durham last week and talked about Durham. He didn't have too much to say in the way of local specifics. When he was pressed about extending the GO train to Bowmanville, he said it was a 343-page budget and he couldn't keep track of all the specific details. So, spoiler alert, it's not in there. He also said that we asked the Minister of Transportation what we did when he came to Pickering for a transportation summit recently, and he said everything was under review. Back to my suggestion about that would be on a good PC license plate, under review. Um, he did tell us about Kitchener, though. The Minister of Environment, Conservation and Parks, the President of the Treasury Board, also from Durham, they talk about it being Durham's time speaker, and I'd love to believe them. I think they are also desperate to believe that. Um, a few things that would matter to Durham that we didn't see in this budget, but we're still hopeful for. Take the tolls off the 412 and 418. It was something you campaigned on after we made it as a campaign announcement. I have a private member's bill, Bill 43. You know what? You don't have to wait for the debate on it, although it's coming. You could just take the tolls off. Um, you know, like if you're if you're going to remove them, the budget was the perfect opportunity. So get at it because we are going to be debating it in this room on the official record. The employment lands, Speaker, along the 412, 418, the 407 East, the employment lands. Our municipalities are waiting to have an answer if we, if we can have them back. Again, under review is not good enough. Durham wanted to see more from this budget, and we hope we will see more going forward. Thank you. Thank you very much.